My name is John Glazer. I'm Director of Foreign Policy Studies here at the Cato Institute. I'd like to welcome all in attendance. Uh, we have many more people watching online. Um, you know, it's hard to remember if there was ever uh, a candidate for president that came into the office more hostile to the NATO alliance than Donald Trump. Um, Ted writes in his uh, book that we're here to discuss today that he's served as a catalyst for a broadening debate on the NATO alliance as a whole in U.S. foreign policy. Um, and uh, there's certainly no big news about NATO in the past couple of weeks, so be an abstract discussion. Um, let me just introduce our speakers. Ted Galen Carpenter is a senior fellow for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies here at Cato, and he's author of this new book, NATO, The Dangerous Dinosaur. Rajan Menon holds the Anne and Bernard Spitzer Chair in Political Science at the City College of New York. He's a senior research scholar at Columbia University's Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies, and he's a global ethics fellow at the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs. His bio is wrong. <laughs> Nevertheless, he's well qualified to be here. Um, I'll invite Ted up to speak first, and then we'll have a chat about the book. Thank you very much, John. Uh, whenever an author of a policy book puts out a new book, you hope that it's uh, relevant and timely. Well, I would say uh, I lucked out a great deal on this one because uh, we have an ongoing crisis within NATO even as I speak with the United States uh, relationship with Turkey and especially regarding Turkey's uh, military incursion into northern Syria, we have uh, the latest example of an, uh, an alliance in crisis. It's not often that you find one NATO member imposing severe economic sanctions on another and having the President of the United States threatening to destroy the economy of that fellow NATO member. But what we see with Turkey and its actions in Syria is symptomatic of several problems afflicting NATO at the moment. Now, most discussions of NATO focus on the burden-sharing issue. Is Europe doing enough for its own defense? Are the European members of NATO uh, contributing sufficiently to the collective defense effort? Are they spending enough on their own defense in particular? Well, I believe that most of the serious problems afflicting NATO now go well beyond those traditional burden-sharing complaints. And the burden sharing aspect has been around for a very long time, almost since the beginning of NATO. After all, we had John Foster Dulles in late 1953 warning the European allies that if they didn't do more for their own defense, if they didn't support the collective defense effort better, then the United States might have to conduct a, quote, agonizing reappraisal of its European security commitments. More recently, we, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown under uh, President Bill Clinton gave the NATO allies a very blunt warning, warning that the United States was getting tired of their free riding, of their lack of a commitment to the collective defense effort. Two secretaries of defense under Barack Obama, Robert Gates and Chuck Hagel, made similar statements in uh, meetings with the NATO allies. 
So the burden sharing issue is a very familiar one, frankly, a tired one. What Donald Trump did was simply carry on that legacy of US complaints, as usual in a less diplomatic manner than his predecessors. But in terms of substance, there wasn't much new in terms of that aspect of his uh, indictment of NATO. But as I said, I think there are newer, more serious problems uh, bedeviling the alliance. And th those problems really do threaten the viability of NATO going forward. One is the rising authoritarianism among NATO members. That's certainly the most advanced with regard to Turkey, which is now little more than a thinly disguised dictatorship under President Erdogan. But you see similar developments taking place in other NATO members, especially Hungary and Poland. And we're beginning to see some of those same developments take place in Italy and a number of other NATO powers. Another problem afflicting NATO are increasingly acute policy disagreements among members. We see that with a number of issues, but two really stand out. One is policy toward Iran, where the Trump administration uh, basically reversed course uh, from what the Obama administration had been doing and intensified the confrontation with Tehran. The European members of NATO have made it very clear that they are not willing to go along with that policy. And indeed, when the United States uh, imposed new economic sanctions on Tehran, its European allies uh, went out of their way to try to shield Iran from the main effects of those new sanctions, and of course, to protect some of their own businesses, which were in danger of uh, being affected by those sanctions. But it's clear the European members of NATO are not on board for a highly confrontational policy toward Iran. And I'm not, uh, I, I certainly don't believe that that's going to change at any point in the near future. There are also rising disagreements about policy toward Russia. And following the uh, Russian seizure of Crimea, you had a fair degree of policy harmony among the NATO members, that action had to be taken, that uh, the imposition of sanctions was appropriate. But European enthusiasm for those sanctions has been waning almost ever since they were imposed. And now you see European leaders openly questioning the efficacy of those sanctions and expressing the desire to have them eased and eventually phased out to try to restore a more uh, harmonious relationship with Moscow. That policy disagreement is likely to get worse, not better, in the coming months and years. And then there is the rising European sentiment for neutrality. I had an article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago, which went into some detail about that. And it focused on a recent poll that uh, was taken by the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is a thoroughly establishment organization. And it confirms the growing sentiment for neutrality in Europe. The survey covered some 60,000 people in 14 European Union countries. And even with regard to NATO's mission of standing up to Russia, that neutralist sentiment was evident. When asked whose side should your country take in a conflict between the United States and Russia, the majority of respondents in all 14 EU countries said neither. 
Now, the temptation has been to blame Donald Trump for all of this. But that erosion of NATO solidarity was well underway before Trump arrived on the scene. And it applied even to NATO's core mission of collective defense. The results of a 2015 Pew research survey of eight NATO countries showed that, again, this sentiment was on the rise before the prospect of a Donald Trump presidency was considered even uh, the, the most remote prospect. The Pew poll showed that among Europeans, a median of 49% of respondents thought their country should not defend an ally. Now that's a response that shows a lack of commitment to collective defense, the core of NATO's mission. Indeed, France, Italy, and Germany all had majorities opposed to fulfilling their country's commitment under Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty to consider an attack on any NATO member as an attack on all. So that's the heart and soul of NATO. And yet, majority of respondents rejected that. The more recent poll by the Council, uh, European Council on Foreign Relations, really shows the extent of neutralist sentiment, how much it is built. In France, only 16% would back the United States in a conflict against Russia. 63% opt for neutrality. In Italy, it's 17% versus 65%, and in Germany, 12% versus 70%. And the results are similar in uh, NATO's newer East European members, despite their greater exposure to Russian pressure and potential aggression. Attitudes are no better, no pro, be, more pro-U.S. regarding other foreign policy controversies than it is with regard to a U.S. conflict with Russia. When asked which side should your country take in a conflict between the United States and China, the results were lopsided against backing America. Now, to give you just a, a few examples of that, in... Uh, the Czech Republic, only 20% were willing to back the United States. In Romania, it was 17%, 13% in Hungary. And if you think it's better with regard to America's traditional NATO powers in, East, in Western Europe, think again. The results were as bad or worse. Only 18% of French respondents, 15% of Italians, and 10% of Germans chose solidarity with the United States. Now that certainly highlights a problem of NATO solidarity and all the statements coming out of NATO summits about enduring solidarity won't change that. There is growing sentiment as well related to this for an independent foreign policy for Europe and for a European-only military. The United States must recognize the changing conditions, I would argue, phasing out NATO and working with a new independent European security entity, either through the European Union or with an entirely new organization. NATO was designed to meet a totalitarian superpower threat that no longer exists. That's not to say there weren't other reasons, including preventing the renationalization of defenses in Europe, the kind of problem that had led to so many conflicts in the past. But it is impossible to imagine a NATO being created had it not been for the perception of a very serious threat from the Soviet Union. Well, that world no longer exists. And adding new dependents and vulnerable new members for the United States to defend weakens 
not strengthens America's security. My colleague, Doug Bondo, I think has put it very well that over the past couple of decades, the United States has added security dependence with less selectivity and care than most people add Facebook friends. There's one big difference though. You're not called upon to defend Facebook friends and there's no danger that your Facebook friends are going to get you into a destructive war. There is with adding security dependence through the NATO alliance. Now, one of the worst aspects, most dangerous aspects, is the deterioration of the West's relationship with Russia. And that, I think, has been NATO's biggest blunder by far. Most present and former U.S. officials blame Russia entirely for this. One of the few exceptions was Robert Gates, who served as Secretary of Defense under both George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. I'm sorry, uh, Barack Obama. Gates put it with unusual candor. He said, I believe that the relationship with Russia had been badly mismanaged since George H.W. Bush left office in 1993. And he specifically cited NATO's expansion eastward. Gates said that move recklessly ignored what Russia considered its own vital interests, and I think he's absolutely correct with that. He goes on, when Russia was weak in the 1990s and beyond, we did not take Russian interests seriously. We did a poor job of seeing the world from their point of view and managing the relationship for the long term. And he points out that even before Vladimir Putin came to power, the Western powers treated Russia as a de facto enemy. The United the uh, NATO powers engaged in provocations, even though Moscow had engaged in no aggressive conduct that even arguably justified that action. And I think that's, that's clearly true. Expanding a powerful alliance right up to the borders of another major power will not be considered as anything other than an extremely provocative, hostile act. Regardless of the nature of that government, regardless of who is in power running policy in that country, and beating up on uh, long-standing clients of that major power, as the United States did in the Balkans against Serbia, certainly intensified the problem. The bottom line is Donald Trump was right when he said that NATO is obsolete. Indeed, it is dangerously obsolete. And those who tend to reject that conclusion simply because Donald Trump said it are wrong. I would remind them that even a broken clock is right twice a day. This was one of Donald Trump's occasions when he was right. We need an entirely new, less risky and burdensome foreign policy. And trying to preserve NATO or trying to remodel it to handle the conditions of the modern world is simply not going to work. We need an entirely new European policy for the United States. Thank you. So uh, I thought I might give Rajan a chance to kind of discuss. Um, you've read the book. You can respond to some of the comments. I'm going to get out from under these lights because I feel like a French fry in McDonald's. It's, and then there's the glare. So if you cannot hear me, let me know. About 12 years ago, I wrote a book calling into question the future of American alliances. 
At the time, shall we say, it was, it was distinctly unfashionable at best and heresy at worst, except for people such as Ted Carpenter, who was then and now ahead of the curve. He was extraordinarily generous to me when I was writing that book and gave me support. And Ted, I want to thank you and say how delighted I am to be here for the opening of yet another book of yours. This man is a book factory. It's absolutely extraordinary. I want to start by giving NATO its due. In 1945, there was a power vacuum in Western Europe because of the drastic and disastrous results of World War II. And European and American states, women, and men rose to the occasion and undertook three strategic initiatives that in hindsight are nothing short of strategic genius, I would say. The Marshall Plan in 1947, the creation of what would eventually become the EU, but in 1952 was called the European Coal and Steel Community, and in 1949, NATO. The purpose of NATO could be then described by putting it on a bumper sticker. It was to deter and failing that, defeat the Soviet Union. If you put it to the test by quoting the quip of its first Secretary General, Lord Ismay, who said the purpose of NATO was to keep the Russians out, the Germans down, and the Americans in, it succeeded wonderfully well. So three cheers for NATO in the Cold War period. But alliances, and I think this is the import of Ted's remarks, are contingent in their circumstances. And however much there may be ethereal calls about eternal values and friendships that never die, the world is a rather more different place. Circumstances change and alliances don't last forever. So I would argue that in 1991, an opportunity was missed to mimic the ingenuity of those of 1945. Rather than create a trans-European security architecture that was new, and it would have been bold, which would have integrated Russia into the West, which is what Gorbachev called for, you may recall, as early as 1989. The decision was taken to expand NATO serially in seven stages. An alliance that at its Cold War height had 16 members, Two decades hence, now has 29 with Macedonia, I think, having signed on but not yet joined. Is that right, Chris? I think that's right. Yes. Um, the rationale for this was democracy promotion. But that never made any sense to me because the causal relationship between a military alliance, which is deterrence and war fighting, and the invigoration <laughs> and consolidation of democracy is far from clear. And if that were the objective, why not the EU and various other bilateral things that the United States could have also done? As Ted pointed out, it would be an extraordinary thing historically if the movement of NATO toward its borders had not been seen as a hostile act by Russians. I had a discussion the other day with somebody who claimed to me that this only became a problem under Vladimir Putin. That is simply false on its face. There's abundant records, including now based on declassified information, that starting at least as early as 1990, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, who was then the head of the Russian Federation, what would become the Russian Federation, the RSFSR within the USSR, going on till NATO began actually expanding in 1999, said again and again and again, that they saw this as an unfriendly act and that they were perplexed by it because on the one hand, they were being called a partner and told that the Cold War was over. On top of that, their economy was collapsing. It contracted by one third in the 1990s, right? Their military was a shambles. There were manifestly no threat and the expansion was going on. You have to understand, those of us who spent time in the Soviet Union back in the day, there was ingrained in the Soviet mind or the Russian mind, whether you like it or not, the notion symbolically of this alliance being an enemy alliance. Now, we can have a debate about the extent to which what's being called the new Cold War had to do with NATO expansion. And I'm not here to tell you that everything that has gone wrong is due to NATO expansion. I'm not here to tell you that everything that's happened within Russia 
creeping authoritarianism and what have you has to do with Russia. But I will tell you this. I don't think any historian 20 years from now who looks at this period will write a credible book of history without taking into account the effect that NATO expansion had on east-west relations and state formation within Russia. By the way, it was not just the liberal left or the realists or the isolationists that were warning about this. Card-carrying hawks warned about it. Paul Nitza, Richard Pipes, George Kennan, not a hawk later on, but one time a hawk, and a slew of academics. And they proved to be utterly prescient in terms of what the effect would be. So this is not a problem that began with Putin, although this much is true. In the 1990s, and Ted implied as much, the Russians were too weak to do anything. In 2000, things changed, and they pushed back. Now, no one with a sense of history ought to be surprised by this. You can disagree with it. You can be upset at Putin for doing it, but you can't. Now, Ted mentioned the many problems that are occurring within NATO. And I won't speak to those because he's spoken to it much more eloquently than I can. But I will say this. The way out of this box for Europe is to stop being strategically infantilized by the United States and summon the capacity to articulate its own defense. Now, this is looked upon as heresy. But ladies and gentlemen, why? The GDP of the United States is about 20.5 trillion, give or take. The GDP of the EU that I'm using as a proxy, because there's a great overlap between NATO and the EU, so give me that license, is about 18.9 trillion, right? So manifestly, it cannot be about lack of capacity. And yet, the 2% of GDP allocated for defense, which was the agreement a soft agreement in Wales in 2014, the NATO summit. Do you know how many states have met that target? Four, and barely. Another four are close, but even if you count the eight, you're talking about a fifth of the alliance having done this. To quote Robert Gates, the United States cannot manifestly be more concerned about the defense of Europe than Europe itself. There's something wrong with that. Now, the Europeans say in defense, well, this is wrong, you know, this is this American beating up on NATO because we have a combined defense budget of 260 billion, second only to the United States and ahead of China. Well, that makes it even more perplexing. If you have a defense budget of 260 billion and you're facing a state, Russia, that has about a tenth of your GDP, and a defense budget that is 56 billion, you really have to give us untutored individuals an explanation as to how that could possibly be. It cannot be the lack of capacity, it is the lack of will. Let me give you an example that will drive this home. Recently, there was a report by the German Bundestag, the, Ber uh, the Bartels Report. If you haven't read it, I commend it to you. <clears throat> So this is not American criticism, it's European criticism. It's a scathing critique of the Bundeswehr, the, the, the German military, for lacking everything from body armor to night vision equipment to helicopters and being in a situation where 50% of the major weapons platforms, tanks, uh, aircraft, jets, are not operationally ready. How is it possible that a country that has the biggest economy in the EU, about 25%, 24%, depending on whether you use exchange rates or purchasing power parity, can allow this to happen given that it is a frontline state? So to the extent that these problems percolate, the ones that Ted was talking to, and there are tensions that develop in the alliance, the only way for, for Europe to get out of this box and if I were a European, this is what I would do if I had the ability to wave a, wave a magic wand, <clears throat> to articulate your own defense. I just came from Moscow, and nothing has changed. I, I don't see any change in the European position on defense. 
airy references to norms and common values and so on, which is a realist I'm suitably cynical about, but no change. Now, we are to blame for this, not just for having strategically infantilized Europe, without the United States, nothing can be thought or done, but there's a further problem. I think the people on the right who are neocons and the people who are on the, on the liberal side are liberal interventionists, both the species of Leninists, in my view, um, because of their enamoredness with social engineering, um, rather like the idea the second most important center of military power, uh, economic power in the world is dependent on the United States for so elemental a thing as its defense. It makes us the hegemon. So when people from Harvard or the Council on Foreign Relations go to Europe and have this weary look of carrying the burdens of Europe and wag their finger at the Europeans for not doing enough, there's a little, there's a, more than a little bit of hypocrisy to this. One final point. Despite this incapacity, operationally and politically, NATO, while it said it was relevant for Europe, also said it risked becoming obsolete. It had to either go out of area or out of business. Do you remember this? Well, how can it possibly do anything out of area when it can't do anything in area? If you look at Afghanistan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Libya, and you look at the proportion of kinetic power, personnel deployed, personnel wounded or lost, oddly enough, it comes to about 67, 68% on the American side. Without the US, all pretense to out of area operations are a patina where US led operations have a multilateral veneer. Now that might be wonderful as a kind of magician's trick, but it really doesn't fool anybody. And I, I submit to you that as our budget deficit, which is now a trillion dollars, and our national debt, which is $22 billion, and as our suicide and opioid epidemic goes through the roof as it already is, and as our infrastructure, I come from New York, I can tell you this firsthand, is dilapidated, and as our workers suffer stagnant wages, I think it will be very hard to sell the status quo to the United States which therefore means that in its own self-interest and not as a favor to the United States, Europe ought to do more for its own defense. That much we can ask it and that much it can do. Thank you. Very good, thank you Rajan. Um, I wanna get into some of the history to provide the appropriate context and understanding for what's going on today, but uh, I think it's also important to start with some current events. So um, let's talk about uh, what's going on with Turkey and Syria. Here we have a case in which the United States engaged in a tactical alliance of convenience with the Kurdish population in, in Syria uh, in the fight against ISIS. Uh, from the very beginning, this unnerved our NATO ally Turkey. Uh, and recently, um, the President Trump uh, initially relocated and then eventually withdrew the thousand or so troops that we have uh, in northern Syria and uh, at least implicitly greenlit uh, Turkish incursions into Syria to attack the Kurds and uh, ensure that there could not be some sort of cross-border safe haven for the PKK or the uh, Kurdish population in, in, in Southeast. Um, you know, what does this say about how we choose our alliances and how well thought out they are uh, and how difficult it is to engage and follow U.S. interest in a situation like this when we're sort of caught between various commitments? That's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, I have a new article in the National Interest which discusses that problem, that the more... Uh, security obligations the United States has, the more security dependence and allies that it has, the greater the probability that uh, some of those allies are going to have major conflicts with each other, incompatible agendas, incompatible goals. And you certainly have that with the uh, addition of the Syrian Kurds as a U.S. ally slash 
dependent. Uh, because the Kurdish agenda, whether it's in Syria or Iraq, is directly uh, contradictory to what Turkey regards as its vital interests. Uh, Ankara has already had to deal with a de facto independent Kurdish entity in northern Iraq that emerged, uh, certainly after the Iraq War, but to a large extent even after the Persian Gulf War in the early 1990s. And from a Turkish standpoint, the Kurdish ambition for an independent Kurdish homeland automatically threatens Turkey's security and territorial integrity. They regard this, uh, given the large Kurdish population in southeastern Turkey, as a mortal threat to Turkish uh, territorial integrity. So when the Syrian Kurds began to emulate their Iraqi brethren and take control of roughly 25% of Syrian territory, uh, substantially more, by the way, than the amount of territory that has a Kurdish plurality or Kurdish majority. Uh, Ankara regarded this as a very serious problem and one in which the United States was facilitating. So we saw rising demands on Ankara's part to um, that the United States back off from this support. And it appears that President Trump has finally done that in a very limited way, but he, as so often the case, gives conflicting signals. He gave a tacit green light to Turkey to take action against the Syrian Kurds and at least create a buffer zone in northern Syria. And almost on the heels of doing that, threatened the Turks with severe economic sanctions and the destruction of its economy. If obliteration, it I think. Obliteration was the word. <laughs> is his uh, subtle term. Yes, yeah. and uh, but this this illustrates a much larger problem for the United States. We had this difficulty even during the Cold War era between Turkey and Greece, uh, two allies, frankly, who hated each other a lot more than they hated uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, the more dependence we add, the more occasions where we're going to see this kind of problem. And the U.S. called upon, called upon to play referee among uh, allies or security dependents. So that, that's one of the more subtle problems associated with NATO expansion, where we can definitely see that beginning to develop. Rajan? <laughs> For those of us who belong to what has now come to be called a camp of restraint in the American foreign policy community, finally we're having a debate in, about American foreign policy, wonder of wonders, it's become very difficult to make the case that there's a considered strategic reason for withdrawal from Syria because President Trump has, in word and deed, so poisoned the well. Because whatever you may think of the strategic rationale that he adduces, such as he does, there's no question that it was done without, to the best of my knowledge, any consultation with the civilian and military advisors. No plan for making sure our troops could withdraw with enough uh, force protection westward and eastward along the M4 highway. No consultation with allies. And almost kind of, uh, in Freudian terms, foreign policy by id and tweet. But I do think that there was not a strong, and there is now a diminishing rationale for staying this. There is a problem involving the Kurds and the states in which they're parceled out. Syria, Turkey, Iran, and who am I missing? Iraq. But this is a legacy of the imperial powers, Britain and France, and the Treaty of Sèvres. It is not something that we can fix. This will go on, and whenever there's a state that's in difficulty, such as Syria is, it will rise again. So Barack Obama, who handed this problem to President Trump, by the way, wanted to 
suppress ISIS in the vast regions of northern, northeastern Syria. But of course, like all American presidents, had a healthy aversion to civilian casualties because they're not admitted to American military casualties. And for good reason, they're not popular here. We, we like to do things as much as possible from the air on the cheap. Fair enough. But we used as our local agent, essentially the YPG, the People's Protection Units, which is the military arm of the PYD, a Kurdish, um, a Syrian Kurdish party. And we had a few, uh, some special forces now reduced to about a thousand or so. But the difficulty is that if you use as your proxy an ethnic group that has claims and designs over areas that are not majority Kurdish, you are adding yet another layer to what is a complicated civil war. But of course, then we come back to ISIS. Now, I'm under no illusions about how serious terrorism is as a threat to the United States. I think it is a serious threat. I think we need to work very hard to defeat it on multiple fronts. But I don't, I must say, understand the rationale for the cocktail of special operations, opera uh, special operations campaigns, drone strikes, and the reliance on regional proxies ad nauseum, because I'm not sure where this ends. This is like a whack-a-mole game. You know, terrorist groups are rather like Walmart or McDonald's that I've already invoked. Um, they move around worldwide. It, it, some of them are kind of antediluvian in their ideology, but they're incredibly adept at using modern technology. But whereas McDonald's and Walmart look for stability, right? Infrastructure, political stability. Terrorist organizations do exactly the opposite. They look for instability and chaos because they can ensconce themselves there. Now, there are a great many, num a great many countries in the world, about 195, give or take. A fair number of them are unstable. So we can do this until kingdom come and if we continue doing it in a way that leaves countries more unstable rather than less, because our record in terms of nation building and sta stabilization is checkered at best, we recreate the problem. So I don't have a problem with the idea of withdrawing from Syria. I think there are good ways and better ways to do it. But I think in the end, what was done was the proper thing. The way it was done was not proper. One other thing. Whatever one may think of Mr. Erdogan or Mr. Trump, I didn't vote for President Trump. I don't plan to vote for him. I'm not a fan of Erdogan, so I'm not here to, as anyone's diplomatic representative. The idea that a country of Turkey's size and magnitude and nationalism would tolerate the possible rise on its southern flank of a manifestly separatist group when it has had a long insurgency in southeastern Turkey, which by the way, it's handled very brutally, that's another story, and would not do anything, was utterly foolhardy. You don't want to take a stand in a place where capability and willpower are on the other party's side. So ask yourself this, how many Americans, if told that we have to send troops to fight and die in Syria to prevent the uh, Syrian defense forces, really a, a Kurdish operation, dressed up with some Sunnis and Assyrians and so on, to save the uh, Syrian Kurds, and that it might take some time and many soldiers could die, would support it. I would be shocked if you could summon a majority in this country to do that. So the strategic environment is all wrong, it seems to me. Ter Turkey has extraordinarily strong reasons to do what it is doing, whether you like it or not, right? And on our side, it's quite clear that that's not the case. And Erdogan, whatever else he may be, is no fool. He understands this. Now, one final point. It is said that Russia has made a strategic bonanza out of this. Now, this to me is hilarious. First, they said Russia went into 2000 and uh, into Syria in 2015 because Barack Obama was weep, weak. I mean, this is strategy by solipsism. <laughs> Wherever anything happens, it must have to do with us. 
The Russians had a strategic investment in Syria going back to 1954 for many, many good reasons. It had nothing to do with perception of, perceptions of our weakness. Have they made a difference? Yes. But what has been the inheritance? A smoldering ruin and a regime that is drenched in blood and isolated across the world, if that is strategic victory, I hate to think what strategic defeat looks like. But this is the baying that is coming out from the major op-ed pieces and from talking heads on television that it is a moral catastrophe. We let down the Kurds, who knew exactly what they were doing when they got into this, um, that's, that Turkey is doing something absolutely abominable. Can you imagine how long we would tolerate a separatist state on our border? Why would we expect other states to do it? I and mean, put aside the whole business of whether Erdogan is a good guy or a bad guy. That, I'm not into morality politics. So I, I, it seems to me uh, withdrawal is not a bad idea. But I will say this, it's become harder to defend because it's, so, it's associated with President Trump. You're always called a Trump supporter and you have to say, no, I'm not a Trump supporter. There are other good reasons and I'm tired of running around. I might as well go around the sandwich board that has that written on it. You know, we are offering lunch at the end of this event, but I think you might prefer a Big Mac. Maybe we should take a ride. <laughs> Having invoked McDonald's twice. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, if I could add just one point sure, to that. Go ahead. I think the U.S. support for the Syrian Kurds is yet another example of tunnel vision in US foreign policy. We're focused on one objective. Okay, we're trying to defeat ISIS. The Kurds are useful allies in doing that. Therefore, this is a good idea to make a tactical alliance with the Syrian Kurds. Without really examining the other um, consequences that may flow from that, however unintended some of those consequences might be, I think we saw the same thing with NATO's expansion eastward. Well, we're enlarging the arena of democracy. We're promoting uh, Western influence and tying the Central and Eastern European countries to the democratic West and, oh, by the way, to an institution completely dominated by the United States, NATO. It was amazing the number of people in the US foreign policy establishment during this period of NATO's enlargement eastward, who portrayed this as not at all a hostile act toward Russia. And the worst thing about that is I think some of them at least believed that, that the Russians would regard this as some of the defenders said, as enlarging the zone of stability on Russia's Western front, something that would actually serve Russia's interests in the long run. Now, I think these are the same kind of people who would uh, regard an offer for uh, on a great deal on a used bridge in Brooklyn as a uh, smart economic move, but they seem to actually believe that, that they could expand NATO eastward and there wouldn't be any unpleasant side effects. That has proven to be disastrously wrong. So you almost you took my uh, seg segue away, but yes, so this, I was going to make note of this and to put perhaps a finer point on it, what, you know, U.S. policy in Syria is indicative of a larger tendency in our foreign policy to uh, find it very easy to get into conflicts and to make alliances, but find it very difficult to get out of them when conditions change. And uh, so we went into Syria primarily uh, to deal with ISIS, and then sooner or later we ended up adopting policies including protecting Israel, protecting the Kurds on a presumably indefinite basis, uh, pushing back against Russian and Iranian influence in Syria, uh, perhaps undermining the Assad regime in, in certain ways. Uh, that's, a, that's a host of additional objectives that crept up on the initial mission. And the same is true with uh, NATO expansion. Uh, you know, we had this alliance. It made sense in a Cold War context. The collapse of the Soviet Union uh, took away that initial objective, and, and we adopted additional missions to justify staying in and expanding an alliance. There's a lot of talk these days about the decision to go east um, and whether it was uh, in contradiction to uh, certain implicit or explicit promises that we gave to the Russians 
um, at the end of the Cold War. Do you want to talk about the decision and the subsequent um, uh, adding of alliances towards, towards Russia's uh, border? Well, there certainly uh, were at least implicit assurances to Russia, and I think some of the new declassified documents suggest that it may have been even a bit more than implicit assurances uh, that the U.S. Uh, favored stopping NATO at the eastern border of a united Germany, that if Russia agreed to uh, the uh, unification of Germany within NATO, and that was a key feature of the U.S. demand, that if Russia accepted that, and that's a big concession on their part, we would not uh, push to expand NATO beyond the eastern border of a united Germany. Um, I don't know if the George H.W. Bush administration was serious about that or if that was just a tactical ploy to get Moscow's consent. The Clinton administration, within months of taking office, committed itself privately to expanding NATO eastward, to take in the Central and East European uh, nations that had just escaped uh, the Warsaw Pact and the status of being Soviet satellites. And that uh, first stage of NATO expansion took in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. That annoyed Russia, as Boris Yeltsin made very clear on several occasions to Bill Clinton. The second stage that went into, went further east and took into uh, the alliance, the Baltic republics that had been constituent parts of the Soviet Union, that was considered even more provocative almost across the political spectrum in Russia. But Russia was terribly weak economically and militarily and really couldn't do much about that. When George W. Bush talked about going even farther east and bringing in Georgia and Ukraine. I think at that point, uh, Moscow drew a line. And if you want to read something very interesting, read Vladimir Putin's speech to the Munich Security Conference in 2007, where he is complaining loudly about NATO's move east, its other provocations, including its uh, trashing of uh, the Russian ally Syria in the, in the Balkans, and warning that this was going to have a seriously adverse impact on Russia's relations with the West. He is making a very clear announcement. Early the next year, the United States leads an effort to grant Kosovo independence, again, striking at a Russian ally, Syria. And it-, it, it Serbia. Serbia, I'm sorry. Um, the way this was done was especially nasty because technically the occupation of Kosovo in 1999, after, our brief NATO-led war, supposedly this was a UN-governed mission after the fact. The United States basically created an ad hoc coalition with its some of its European allies. Not even all NATO members, not even all EU members favored this, but just arbitrarily granted Kosovo independence. And the uh, US Deputy Secretary of State at the time said, now this sets no precedent. Understand that because, well, we say so. Uh, I think that was the breaking point for Russia when um, Georgia initiated a conflict with one of its secessionist region, regions, South Ossetia, in, later in 2008. Moscow used that as a pretext to uh, use strong military force against Georgia. That was a message to the United States and NATO. We've had enough. Do not think you can keep coming eastward. Keep treating our interests 
our allies with contempt because we're no longer going to take it. And the interesting thing about that is Russia did not continue to occupy all of Georgia. It eventually withdrew its forces. That's why I think it was a warning shot, not the beginning of Russian expansionism. But the West reacted as though, oh my God, look at this. The Russians are committing aggression. The Russians are just like the Soviets were. And we have to take action against that. The East-West relationship has deteriorated ever since that point, very sharply. John, may I add a quick point sure. on, you could, Ted has talked about uh, the Munich speech, which I, those of you who have not read it, I commend it to you because it's something of a turning point. There is a tendency to look at Vladimir Putin, who's by no means you know, a blameless person, let alone a saint, as somebody who's walked unreconstructed through time, unchanged. But that's simply not the case. The early Vladimir Putin, like Gorbachev and Yeltsin, suggested that Russia join NATO. Now, you might say he was just bluffing, but he was never taken up on his word. After 9-11, he was one of the first, if not the first, leader to call um, President Bush. Now, let me fast forward to 2008, the um, Bucharest summit of NATO. Georgia and Ukraine were not given a map, a membership action plan. But the communique after the summit said, they will one day be in NATO, and we look forward to them being in NATO. Now, this suggested to the Russians that there is no limit to NATO expansion, and that furthermore, the post-Soviet state to which they historically, culturally, and strategically attach the most importance Ukraine would be in NATO. Now, people say, well, but what about Ukraine's right to self-determination and they can exercise self-determination? My response is countries can exercise all kinds of rights, but it doesn't impose any burden on the United States to underwrite that right. Now, in 2008 at the Bucharest uh, summit, um, or shortly after, Putin is quoted in a, in a wonderful book that I would commend to you by the investigative reporter Mikhail Zigar. It's available in English. Um, all, the, all Putin's men or something like this. More poetic than that, perhaps. He said in 2008, if Ukraine joins NATO, now listen to this, it will do so without Crimea and without the Donbass. Now, I'm not wow. telling you, I want to be very careful, I'm not telling you that the annexation of Crimea was proper and not an act of aggression. I'm not here to tell you that the annexation of Crimea was legal because the referendum flatly contradicted the constitution of Ukraine. I'm not here to tell you that there's no Russian involvement in the East. I'm simply here to tell you that when you push toward a revived great power and alliance, you should expect some pushback that then you have to deal with and ask yourself questions like, well, should we now arm Ukraine? Well, we've already gone ahead and done so. There was a debate at the Atlantic Council that I took part in before a rather hostile audience, I might say, um, where people were very much in favor of doing this. But ask yourself this, if a US equipped Ukrainian army for whatever complicated set of reasons, gets into a conflict with Russia and begins to collapse, there will be two reactions. We don't want to get involved in a war with Russia, never mind that we set the stage for it, or American credibility is at stake, so we must therefore reinforce our troops there. Now, if you want to pick a fight with Russia, I submit to you that there are probably 1,000 other better places on the face of the earth if you just look at the map, right? So the point is not that the Ukraine crisis was caused by NATO expansion so much as it is not a fantasy to believe that the Russians thought that the Maidan and our enthusiasm for it, and the Ukrainians have every right to stage the Maidan, would have set the stage in the wake of Bucharest for Ukraine to join NATO. And they were not going to have that. And now here we are. Uh, so I have two more issues I want you guys to uh, to talk about. Let's see if I, I hope I can fit both of them in. 
Uh, one is to go back briefly to the burden sharing issue. This is a curious issue for me because as you pointed out, Ted, and as you, as you detail in your book, it's long been a complaint of officials at the highest <clears throat> reaches of our government that Europe isn't paying their fair share. But of course, that was part of the design here. The, the idea was to provide for European security so that they would underspend on their defense. It's a, it's a design issue. It's, it's by intention. Uh, it's, not a, it's a feature, not a bug sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, I have a suspicion, and we have to kind of engage in some conjecture here, but is it really the case that Europe is underspending on defense? They don't face major military threats of the conventional kind. Ch threats are changing somewhat in the 21st century. Maybe they want to put more money in, in other areas, for, for example. But uh, if the United States relinquished its security commitment to NATO, are we really sure that across the board there would be higher military spending? It's a very good question. Uh, I've always said that burden sharing in reality meant that the United States wanted the Europeans to pay more for policies largely determined by the United States. This was not, uh, burden sharing would, did not ever mean sharing in, the tr in terms of decision making. And I don't see that attitude changing. Indeed, uh, US officials have always shown great hostility toward any manifestations of a more vigorous uh, security policy on the part of the European allies, especially if they started talking about that kind of policy independent of a US-dominated NATO. Uh, the debates over the European security and defense policy in the late 1990s and early 2000s, an example of that, where US officials responded by saying this, this uh, attempt to create a greater European security effort uh, independent of NATO was a dagger pointed at the heart of NATO. So again, burden sharing on Washington's terms, not anything else. In terms of what Europe uh, would do if the United States phased out its security commitment through NATO, I don't think we would see a giant increase in European defense spending. I think we would see some, Germany in particular, I think would become much more serious about security issues. Um, what I suspect we would see is much greater coordination of existing defense spending and defense efforts. And that is badly needed. Uh, there is tremendous amount of duplication, tremendous amount of inefficiency, and in some cases, uh, defense spending amounts to funding uh, a giant uh, jobs program for young Europeans. Uh, I think we would see much more efficient, focused spending on European defense and much more serious attitudes about security issues, not just in Europe, but in uh, areas surrounding Europe, in particular the Middle East, that they would not defer to the United States to, uh, to manage those problems. And we're already seeing that they're not very happy about how the U.S. is managing those problems. And if the U.S. withdrew the, uh, the overall security commitment to Europe, I think they would become much more focused, much more serious about dealing with those issues, given their, that region's effect on European security and overall European interests. John, a few very quick questions. Mm -hmm. Um, I am very skeptical that there will be a huge change in the patterns in European defense spending if the United States were to withdraw or NATO were to cease to exist, which is something that is now being talked about in a way, by the way, that it never was. It's, and it's just not only by President Trump. Um, there's a publication by a German think tank and IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, that addresses exactly this question. What will the Europeans do? How should they react? And this, that, and the other. But here's why I don't think it'll happen. One, the demographic trends are going to make that very hard. Europe is aging at a faster rate than us, which means a shrinking tax base, fewer taxpayers supporting larger numbers of retirees. What compounds that is the much more extensive welfare state to which there is deep commitment regardless of, of, of country. There is no equivalent of 
the budget cutting Republican Party or no equivalent of the Cato Institute that 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 makes a strong claim for limited government in Europe that has significant traction. Third, much greater anti-war sentiment. You might say, well, they're just as Robert Kagan said, they're from Mars or Venus or what have you. But if you've been on a, you know, when is the last time we had a war fought on our territory? War of 1812, I think. The Europeans have had two wars of, in the last hundred years, which destroyed the continent. And there's a memory of that. And then uh, the rise of populism, whether on the left or on the right. But if you go to events, and I was recently at one, but it's Chatham's rule, so I can't mention what it was, where there are European officials and Russian officials and American officials. The debate between the Russians and the West is, you are still an existential threat, you are terrible. So they're not saying there isn't a threat. So you have to do one of two things. Say there is no threat, we don't need the Americans, and we'll have a strategic plan for gradually developing our own defense. I'm not just saying carrying everything up right away. Or to say, well, there is a threat, or there could be a threat, but because of the numbers that I told you about, we have the wherewithal to, to provide a defense of our own against it. The numbers simply put a lie to the argument that the Europeans cannot do that. There is just no way to look at the numbers and, and, and make that case. But I don't know whether it's the prevailing view that there isn't any threat. On the one hand, there are polls that you know, Ted mentioned that are right, but the, the, but the elite, the people in the think tank community, in the universities, who, people who are officials and ex-officials, they still believe there's an existential threat. In fact, in this IISS think tank report, it says the departure of the United States would create an existential threat, quote. quote. But if that's the case, and you think that it's possible, then you've got to do something different from what you're doing now. Uh, so the, the final issue is um, is a difficult one because um, I think back in 2015 we had uh, a guy named from Tufts, Michael Glennon here. Uh, uh, he wrote a book describing um, the institutional and organizational reasons that President Obama found it very difficult to make radical shifts in U.S. security policy on a whole host of issues. Um, you know he. Uh, exhibited rhetorically, but also I think actually tried to, to alter many of the George W. Bush administration's war on terror policies. And he seemed to have difficulty making that shift. He got drawn into some of the same policies that he condemned so frequently. And he actually was pretty explicit about that. Him and his deputy national security advisor uh, called it the blob, essentially the, the foreign policy establishment here which exists oftentimes in a revolving door sort of way with other non-governmental institutions here, uh, is so firmly in favor of this. And NATO is even more difficult. And of course, we've seen Trump come in and be very critical of NATO, and then almost immediately embrace it by uh, reaffirming Article 5 and bringing in Macedonia and promising Brazil non major non-NATO status, et cetera. So, uh, can you talk about the resistance to change here, despite all the realities that your book touches on and what we've talked about today, and the prospects for actually making this kind of shift that you call for uh, in the book? Yeah, that's an excellent question, uh, because we're dealing with entrenched beliefs, attitudes, and interests that have developed uh, over the period of, of seven decades. Those are not easily dislodged. And certainly, uh, President Obama, to some extent, uh, found out just how difficult it was to overcome that kind of policy resistance within the permanent bureaucracy, within the associated uh, community of, of foreign policy experts, and the media that often mouths the same views the same values of that, uh, that permanent bureaucracy. Uh, President Trump has certainly encountered the same thing. And it's not just with regard to NATO issues. Uh, even making uh, policy changes where the entrenched opposition is not as strong, it doesn't go back as far right. in terms of time. His attempt to uh, 
justify getting out of Afghanistan. And what he said in his speech in 2017 is, I believe that we needed to terminate this mission as soon as possible. But all the advice I got from the generals and others persuaded me that I was wrong. Well, of course, given the people he was talking to, these people had a vested interest in maintaining the current policy, presumably forever. And with regard to NATO, it really is preserve it forever. I can't imagine anyone 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, within the media and foreign policy and political establishments in this country, advocating a U.S. withdrawal from NATO. Uh, consider also the economic interests. We didn't really discuss that much today, but Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex, that is a lot stronger, a lot more pervasive today than it was in early 1961 when he gave that speech. You have multi-billion dollar sets of vested interests that want to preserve NATO and other U.S. alliance commitments forever. They have a lot at stake in doing that. So that adds to the difficulty. In any case, it's certainly not an easy mission to make this kind of policy change. But I think uh, those of us who recognize just how dangerously obsolete NATO is we need to make that, that case, even though the prospects for any kind of short-term or probably me, medium-term success are not good. Rajan, I want your thoughts on that as well, but maybe also you could speak to, let's do a thought experiment where there is a rough consensus, or at least enough of one, to make a radical shift in U.S. policy on NATO. Um, can you talk a little bit about implementation? I mean. What should the transition look like? How gradual should it be? It, are there risks inherent in the transition that might have consequences with regard to proliferation of nuclear weapons or uh, some kind of skirmishes appearing? We'll talk about the transition as well. Right, so first to the question you asked, Ted. Mm -hmm. I'm hard pressed to think of an instance where President Obama made a concerted effort to make a strategic change of direction in the foreign policy of this country, really wanted to do it, and was stopped by this, this entity called the blob. I mean, who are they? Talking heads, people in think tanks, and pointy-headed professors? I mean, we're completely, you know, uh, non-formidable people. I think Obama came out of that consensus. I think despite all the chess beating, the difference between the liberal internationalists and the neocons between the Democrats and the Republicans on foreign policy is way exaggerated. I think there's much more consensus on maintaining American hegemony. My, my, by hegemony, I don't mean anything bad, but being the dominant power on the, in the world, which means being pretty much everywhere doing everything almost for everyone. And that if you don't do that, then there are falling dominoes, credibility, and all of these tired nostrums that are trotted out. The history of the Republic shows that, in fact, we are capable of making strategic changes uh, quite significantly. FDR is an example. Wilson is an example. Whether you like the changes or not, I don't know that there's anything. I, I think Ted is right that we've become locked in, in a way, because of certain structural forces. But I don't, I don't buy the argument that, uh, I mean, Glenn is not here to defend himself, so I'm not criticizing him, but I don't buy the argument that but for the blob, there would have been some revolution in foreign policy. I think Obama was utterly conventional in his foreign policy thinking. Uh, and I say that as somebody who voted for him not once but twice, but I don't think he was, he was a revolutionary in foreign policy. On the, uh, uh, you said it was a difficult question, and indeed it is. So I reviewed a book of someone whose name I won't mention because he's not here either, and my criticism of the book is wonderful as a critique, but if we, in the restraint camp, want to be taken seriously, we have to do more than say, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's wrong. We have to articulate an alternative policy. I can't do it very effectively now, but that's what we need to do, but I will, I, I will try to do it. 
there can, cannot be an overnight abandonment of NATO. I don't think it does any good to call into question Article 5 and you know, badmouth the Europeans and so on. That's kind of sandbox uh, strategy. Works on the playground, not very well in the world. But I think we have to have a serious and quiet conversation about how we segue from a Europe that's wholly dependent on American, the United States for its own defense on the continent and uh, a Europe that is more self-sustaining in defense. I think that can be done. I think we have to have a discussion on what exactly an effective counterterrorism policy means beyond the whack-a-mole strategy that we are, we are pursuing. In many areas such as Pakistan, that policy, drone strikes and others, have made the United States less popular uh, rather than more popular. So what would be an intelligent counter, um, counter-terror strategy? I myself uh, am very deeply troubled, and I think this is what gave us, President Trump, by the belief in this country by a large segment of the population that the system is rigged, that people in the establishment look down upon them, and that they have no authentic voice. And if you look at the economic indicators, productivity going this way after 1979, right, and wages kind of like this, whereas in the three decades after World War III, productivity went up and wages went up. Uh, Having no industrial policy to cope with with globalization. If you're gonna have massive change created by markets, you better have some kind of strategy. I don't care if it's a strategy of the libertarians or uh, people who favor an industrial policy as I do, but you better have a strategy and we have it. Otherwise, you're gonna have people who feel left out. Um, Something like half the American population that's looking at savings rates would have to, if they encountered an, um, an expense that exceeded $400, <clears throat> excuse me, without warning suddenly, they would have to either borrow or start selling their possessions. <clears throat> now we are the richest country in the world. I live in New York. Come and visit and take a look at the infrastructure. You know, we are being left behind. So there is no discussion of what the domestic <clears throat> component of a national security strategy would be, none. But of course, you can't do something in the front, right, on the battlefield or some far horizon somewhere that doesn't have support in the rear. That is the lesson of the Vietnam War, it seems to me. And so there has to be some discussion about how how does national security, as we've conceived it traditionally, change so that there's a domestic component of national security. Because what makes most Americans insecure on a quotidian basis is not Russia. It's not even ISIS. It's the daily struggle to make ends meet because companies have decided they can hire contract workers and provide them no benefits. Because child poverty, if you look at us in the OECD, some Democrats said we have the highest child poverty rate in the world. We we don't. But if you look at the OECD countries, I think we're fourth to last. And, and, the, and, and, the, and the thing goes on and on. There's a whole litany of problems. But these are not being addressed. And to the extent that people like Warren and, <clears throat> and Sanders are addressing it, whatever you may think of them, it's not integrated into any concept of national security, where what we do abroad somehow connects organically with, with what we do or don't do at home. So that's, that's a very bad potted summary of what I would do if I were anointed king. <laughs> <clears throat> Ted, unless you have final thoughts, we can go to Q&A. Well, we'll go to Q&A. Okay. Yep. Uh, so we have time <coughs> for a few questions. The ground rules are that you need to wait for the microphone to be passed to you so that the people watching online can hear you. Uh, identify yourself and any affiliation that you have. And please make it short. Do not make a speech. I'll be a grump and I will interrupt you <coughs> if you try. Uh, we can start here in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, retired from the Department of Agriculture. Thanks for a very interesting discussion. A couple of quick points. On the surveys that you mentioned about the popularity of the United States and the solidarity of 15% with the United States, is the rest really with China, 85% with China solidarity? What does that mean? Number two, is it because we're now viewed in the world as the bullies of the world? The war in Iraq, Afghanistan, the support of, of Saudi Arabia and Yemen, the support of dictatorships around there. Is that part of the reason for this survey for what, what you found? And thanks again for your comments. Thank you. Uh, the 
the organizations that took the surveys did not go into great detail on the reasons for those answers. I think it is interesting that uh, so much of this did predate Trump. So it's deeper than just angry, anger at Donald Trump and his policies. Uh, but I think there was the, the broader sense, if, even if the United States is not a bully, the United States is making unwise commitments that puts uh, the Europeans in greater danger, causes greater problems for the Europeans than would otherwise be the case. And it does reflect a growing determination not to just go along with whatever Washington wants. It is rather unsettling, though, that if the United States is in a conflict, and that was the term used, not dispute or anything milder, a conflict with Russia or China that large majorities of the European public would not support us. And that's the bottom line. Can I just add something? Do you mind if I add something to what you asked? So what's important to recognize, and Ted will correct me if I'm wrong, that the polls that Ted is pointing to, NATO members saying, we may not come to the aid of our fellow allies, we may side with Russia rather than the United States, we may side with China rather than the United States. All, it's tempting to see all of this as something that President Trump created. I'm not here to apologize for him because there's a great many things he's made worse. It predates Trump. There's something going on. I'm not in a position to give you a good answer. You ask a good question. I don't have a very good answer for you, but I think it predates Trump. And I think the end of the Cold War has made, has lowered the stakes for feeling this way and, uh, and, and acting this way. But if Europe is feeling this way and acting this way, it's very dangerous, it seems to me, to feel this way and act this way and then not have an answer to the question. But if you run into difficulty and if nobody answers the 1-800-USA call, right, or lets you not call collect, then, then what is your, as a friend of mine like to say, what is your ultimate plan? You, you must have one. Other questions? On, on the aisle here with the glasses? Uh, left. left? Thanks. Uh, Mitchell Beagle, uh, unaffiliated. <clears throat> I was having a discussion about NATO with a friend a few weeks ago, and he knows a lot more about this than me. And I talked about what you're calling burden sharing or not paying. And he turned to me and he said, oh, so you want Germany to rearm, huh? How did that work out the last two times, World War I and World War II? And I just didn't have an answer. What's the answer to that? Well, <laughs> the, uh, the answer is that... Uh, Things have changed. Uh, the, the answer is that things change. So let's talk for a moment about what I call the transformation of Europe from a community of war to a community of peace. Despite all the disturbing things that are going on about the, the rise of authoritarianism in, in, the, in the East. By the way, this is a global phenomenon. It exists from Beijing to, to Brazil by way of India and the United States. There's something going on that I'm thinking about but don't have a good answer to. I just think that that's kind of a lame argument, with all due respect to your friend, because uh, this argument is also made in the context of Japan. Oh, you want Japan to take care of their own defense? What, what will happen? Will Hirohito's reincarnation arise? The choice is not between militarism and minimalism. There is a whole spectrum of things that can be done. And if Germany is bound together in a European structure, which any sensible German would want to, because they know the legacy of the war, and they know that they cannot single-handedly do it. So the argument that you want Germany to rearm, well, yes, I do want Germany to rearm. <laughs> I do. I don't want the Kaiser back, and I certainly don't want Hitler back, but those are not the options before us. Right. I, I want to hear from you as well, but I, as a guy who argues for more restrained foreign policy on a daily basis, I have yet to have a discussion with someone on the opposite side that doesn't reference Nazi Germany. Yeah. It's, a, it's a habit of theirs because, uh, you know, it was such a lesson of the m middle of the century, last century, that uh, they can't <laughs> see outside of that possibility. Right. But there's another lesson, by the way, of that, right? It is that Europe was not in a position for all kinds of complicated reasons to deal with the threat posed by Germany. It misunderstood the threat posed by Germany. It wasn't that nothing could have been done 
right? It was a, a strategic set of miscalculations anchored <clears throat> partly in the devastation that World War I had visited upon um, on Europe, uh, hangovers left over from the Versailles Treaty and other things like that. I think that in retrospect, and the policy of appeasement, not recognizing Hitler for what he was, sometimes people actually mean what they write and say. Yeah, I would say that, again, the lesson here should be adjust policies to account for current conditions and prospective conditions, not something that was decades in the past. I've argued elsewhere that people who always invoke the Vietnam analogy ought to be charged with a misdemeanor in foreign policy debates. Uh, but people who invoke the Munich analogy all the time uh, should be charged with a Federal felony. Federal crime. <laughs> so that should, that's a felony. And again, you know, how long do we have to go before recognizing that a country has fundamentally changed? Uh, today's Germany is not even close to being Imperial Germany of 1914, much less Nazi Germany. Are we going to uh, say that France can't play a meaningful uh, security role because of Napoleon's depredations? Yeah. We no longer have to worry about Genghis Khan. That's why we're not actively trying to contain Mongolia. You know, right. things change. Th these things are historically. Yeah, that's the lesson. Things. But change. you never know. <laughs> you never know. Um, other questions. Uh, this gentleman in the blue shirt here. Uh, thank you. Dave Rubinowitz, retired. Uh, I was wondering how much of the impetus for the eastward expansion of NATO came from the U.S., how much came from other NATO members, and how much came from the uh, target states or the, uh, the new states themselves? Were they asking to come in or were they invited? It varied. Uh, you certainly had some sentiment, uh, especially the countries that feared Russia the most. So Poland, uh, like Valesa, was actively lobbying to bring Poland into NATO. On the other hand, you had vested interests in the United States really pushing. I mean, it was no accident that the committee uh, on NATO pushing for the first round of expansion that the leader of that was Bruce Jackson, the uh, vice president of uh, Lockheed Martin. You know, these people saw that there were opportunities for billions of dollars in sale of sophisticated U.S. armaments to new NATO members, where there, as there would have been significantly greater restrictions to sell those same weapons to non-NATO members. So again, combination of motives. Uh, you can't just identify one side as pushing forward. And also, I mean, the incentives are there. So the willingness for some European nations, I think, to join NATO uh, doesn't necessarily redound to what a great and important alliance it is. It's essentially the superpower saying, gee, would you like us to subsidize your defense? A uh, few countries are going to say no to that. Just very quickly, uh, it's a very tangled knot, and you can't untie it here. These things are what we call in social science overdetermined. There's too much going on that's causing this one thing. There were electoral considerations, voting banks of East Europeans in the Midwest. And I know from somebody who knew President Clinton very well, that was very much on his mind. There was a lack of resistance within the foreign policy establishment to people, especially when the president made his preferences known to people who pushed very hard for it, in no particular order, Mar Madeleine Albright, uh, Stroke Talbot, uh, who was <laughs> at one point against it, by the way, um, Al Gore, and above all, Richard Holbrook. So people like William Perry, who had concerns about the, he didn't oppose expansion, but he, he, he opposed the rapidity of it, uh, stood no chance. And if you read Perry's memoirs, that comes about very uh, carefully. Um, there, I don't know if I mentioned this, but influential people outside, like Kissinger and Brzezinski uh, um, and, and, and Albright, uh, were very much in favor of this. And the East Europeans wanted it. Now, in their defense, I'll say this. If you went through the history that they went through with Russia, I completely understand their impulse. I completely understand why would they would want to be there. But they're two separate things. Does their impulse, however significant it is, 
require us to take on a security commitment. One doesn't follow from the other in the cold-blooded world of international politics. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I very much encourage you to check out Doug's book. It is for sale. Ted's book. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I often mix up the two senior fellows uh, who have been here the longest. Uh, but Ted's book, sorry about that. Ted. The increasingly senior fellows. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you.